So you've seen us 3D printing an entire Porsche GD3 RS on the main channel and you've decided you want to give it a crack yourself or you're just wondering exactly how we've gone about printing this thing. Well, in this video, I'm going to explain the steps that I've taken to make this thing happen. Of course, I try and fit as much as I can into the videos on the main channel, but there's a lot of the little nitty gritty stuff that I've missed out. And of course, welcome to the second channel, by the way. On this channel, I'm going to be doing a lot more raw vloggy style videos that don't belong on the main channel and a whole bunch of you guys have asked for more content not just on the Porsche but in general and this makes it a lot easier for me to punch out this style of video whilst also making the crazy high production videos that we make on the main channel. So the 3D printed GT3 RS is based on a Porsche Boxster 986 so of course the first thing you're going to want to do is go out and buy yourself a Porsche Boxster 986. The first thing you're going to ask is can I use any other car? Potentially you could. You can definitely use a Porsche Boxster 987, which is the newer one. They're very similar cars. That will work in just the same way. But in terms of using a car that's not a Porsche, that will be infinitely more complicated. This kit is designed, I guess, to go on the Boxster. First and foremost, if you were gonna put it on another car, it would have to be the same wheelbase. Uh, yeah, otherwise you'd be mucking around with a lot of things there. And then you've gotta suss out the width and everything like that. So I'd highly advise, if you're gonna do this, do it on the Boxster exactly how we've done it. Now the Porsche Boxsters vary in price all over the world, but here in Australia, they've actually gotten more expensive. So we got ours for a really cheap price. It was $13,000. And our one was in fantastic condition. I wanted to prioritize that because we're gonna use this as a street car. So I wanted it to be in good condition so I knew that we had a nice car to drive around. Of course, you can find them quite a bit cheaper if you find a crashed one or you find one that's just in not as good condition. I know in other parts of the world, they go for significantly less. I don't know why they're more expensive here in Australia. I think just because they're a bit retro and they're kind of sought after now. There's probably not as many of them here. But yes, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to grab is a Boxster. The second thing you're gonna need is of course the 3D printing files. Now I've done a deal with the creator, so we actually sell those files on twostepgarage.com. The link is in the description. They are 400 Australian dollars, which is insanely cheap. The same price that I paid for the files when I bought them. For the amount of work that's gone into these files is crazy. So that price I think is just ridiculously cheap. Then once you download these files, you're gonna open it and it's going to be pretty mind melting when you start to look at everything. I'm gonna take you guys upstairs and we're gonna jump on the laptop and have a look at these files. But before we do, a quick disclaimer. This is not an easy project by any means. There is a lot of work that's going to go into this. You're gonna to have to be very determined if you want to actually succeed with this project and saying that it's not as difficult as you would think, which kind of contradicts what I just said. But basically what it means is it takes a lot of time and patience to do this project. But once you start to understand the files, it's not actually that difficult. It's just going through the motions of obviously 3D printing everything, making sure your spreadsheet's up to date, which I'm gonna tell you guys about in a second. And of course, dealing with the failures and everything that goes along with 3D printing. Because basically what we're doing is, you know how you would usually buy a whole body kit and do a wide body swap on a car. Well, we're making the wide body to go onto the car before we even modify the car. So it's another whole step backwards. So when you think about that, it's actually kind of a little bit crazy. But let's have a look at the files that you potentially will buy and let me run you through them so it'll save you a little bit of time with your project and understanding the files. So when you open your files, all you are gonna see is all of this. Now this is all super confusing, right? It took me a a lot of hours of just going through it and, and learning kind of what things were but really the one file that you want to concentrate on is this file right here it's called file 250 by 250 so that is the cut files that you need to print on your printers and in that file are all of these files which once again can be very overwhelming right so there's a bunch of pictures in there which I use as reference pictures to build all of our parts so here are your rear quarters the vents, there's literally everything in here. Dash, front bumper, fenders, it's crazy. But basically, each file is a body part and then it'll have the body part underneath it. So this, for example, is one of your whole rear quarters, which is crazy, you can move the file around. And then in that folder is each piece that you need to print on your printer to make 
that rear quarter. Now once again, I highly recommend that you just spend a bunch of time in this folder going through everything and kind of getting your mind around everything. It is actually quite simple once you wrap your head around it and once you start printing, then you'll kind of understand how it all works. So in this rear quarter, for example, there are 56 individual pieces. So how do you keep track of what you've printed and what you haven't printed? Well, I use this spreadsheet right here. It's very simple. I keep it on Google Sheets but basically we have all of the parts in here, right? And then when I slice apart, so I use Ultimaker Cura to slice apart. Here's one that I've done this morning. So this is a bonnet vent here. When I slice it, obviously it tells us the amount of time it's gonna take to print and how much filament it's going to take to print. Now I like to keep that information, right? So I'll put in how much filament, I'll put in the time and that way at the end of the print I can add that all up and I can give you guys information but it's always interesting to know that information for yourself. So say we print part one here, we put those numbers in there and then in the status bar I'll put in progress. So that'll change to orange. That means I know when they're in progress and then when they're complete market is complete it's that simple but honestly doing that in this spreadsheet will help you immensely because without that I'll be absolutely lost so I mentioned before the slicing program I use is Ultimaker Cura there are so many different programs that you can use out there to slice your parts so use whatever you prefer and whatever works for you and your printer so for my settings for the pieces I have 1.2 millimeter wall thickness and 20% infill density so we did a bunch of testing when we were printing the first parts and we printed the first parts at hundred percent infill Obviously that takes a lot more time and a lot more filament and it's not needed for the strength, especially because we're using fiberglass over and underneath our parts. So the pieces are really there to create the shape of whatever we're printing and then the fiberglass will create the strength. And one more thing I would say about the files as well is some of them need repairing. So some of the parts may have like little gaps here that shouldn't be there. Basically what I do when I see something like that is I grab this program called Idea Maker. You can use this to slice your parts as well but I just use it to repair the parts. I basically drag and drop the part into Idea Maker then I just click repair, click yes and then I just save that part in the folder that I dropped it away from, replace the part, and then that part is repaired and ready to print. The parts may print fine as they are, but that's just saved us from a bunch of failures that we noticed from some unrepaired parts. All right, so that's a rundown on the files. Now let's talk about the printers themselves. So if you're like me and you're deciding to do this as your first ever 3D printing piece, which is kind of crazy, you're going to need some printers. Now I chose the Alagoo Neptune 4 Pro printers, but you can choose whatever printers you like. A lot of people have told me that they would prefer that I use Bamboo Labs or something like that. That's all good. These are just the printers that I chose. They're super cheap and affordable and they have been working well for me, but I recommend you need at least two printers if you're going to do this project. As you can see, I have six printers. I just got another one, this enclosed Century Carbon printer, which these guys are actually uh, doing a Black Friday sale on, so you can get them super cheap. In fact, I think you can do get a bunch of their stuff super cheap. Look at this. This is one of the fender vents, the rear quarter vents that we've printed on our new Max printer. And uh, yeah, these printers are doing super well. Really happy with them. We've got another printer over here going. This is printing one of the hood vents, which is really exciting. I'm literally in the middle of filming one of the main channel videos at the moment. But yeah, you're gonna need at least two printers. Obviously, every printer that you get, it absolutely cuts down the printing time by you know a huge percentage. But you should definitely do your own research. Apparently it's really good to get printers that do the auto bed leveling because it saves you a lot of time. Like for those printers in there, I will go back and re-level the beds maybe every week or so just to make sure that they're all good. That new printer that I got, that's auto bed leveling so I'm very excited to give it a crack but I haven't tried it yet so I can't give you my opinion on it just yet. But now let's talk about the parts themselves, all right? Because I don't think it comes across on camera just how thick these pieces are. So I'm gonna get the verniers out now. I'm gonna show you guys. I haven't even measured them myself to be honest. But I did guess, and I think I've guessed correctly. They are six millimeters thick. So that is extremely thick. It's the same thickness that I have for the fiberglass on our fake Lamborghini drift car that we have over there. And that is super strong. I understand that this is only 3D printed plastic, so it's not as strong as fiberglass. But once you overlay the fiberglass underneath on the parts, this stuff is very strong and also very heat resistant. Now, we use PETG filament. I highly recommend that you use PETG as well. But the PETG is very easy to print, which is why we use it. I've also had people reach out to me, right? 
they have fenders on their car that have been on their car for years. They only put fiberglass on the back of their fenders, not even on the top. Then they bodywork the top of the plastic as per normal and their fenders have lasted years with absolutely zero issues, including being in the sun and all that type of stuff. But when they're this thick, you have to worry a lot less about warping in the sun because there's so much material there, right? If they're super thin, then maybe you would have a bit more of an issue when it comes to heat and stuff, but I'm very confident that we'll be able to finish this car, panel and paint it, and we're not gonna have any issues unless we have a crash. But if you have a crash with metal fenders or you have a crash with fiberglass fenders, you're still gonna have damaged fenders nonetheless. Other people have asked about the safety of the car, but we're not changing the crash structure of the car itself, right? We're only changing the panels, even underneath on the bonnet, that is the stock Boxster bonnet skin underneath, so the full structure is still there, and then on the top we just have the 3D printed skin. So safety wise, I don't see too much of a difference between what we had before on the Boxster and what we have now. And in fact, we're going to have a half roll cage and all of that inside the car as well, so we should be pretty darn good there. Then in terms of the things you need to do once you've printed the parts, well you've seen a whole lot of that in the main channel videos, including cutting the rear quarters to make these quarters fit nice and flush. But there are other things we need to do. So these front radiators here, right? Because we're gonna be running much bigger wheels, we need to move the radiators forward. Now that's as simple as making a couple of new brackets so the radiators sit forward and also getting longer hoses, obviously because these hoses only have so much extension before they can't go forward anymore. But we have heaps of room up front here, so we're gonna come nice and far forward so that we have a good turning radius for our nice new wheels. Now these wheels are off my drift car, right? And as you can see, they still don't even fill the guards and that is with 30 millimeter spaces in here, which is absolutely wild. On my drift car, as you can see here, I've got wide body on that and these wheels still absolutely fill the guards. So that's how much bigger the GT3 RS guards are than the Boxster. So bear in mind, you're gonna have to get some pretty baller wheels. Our wheels for the front are 20 by nine and a half, negative 37 offset on the front and 21 by 12, negative 20 offset on the rear. That's measured perfectly to the guards. So we get that flush GT3 RS fitment, which is gonna be crazy. Then of course, you also need to cut your guards up, which is what we're going to be doing as part of our video later today for the main channel. We're probably gonna put airbag suspension in this car, which means we need to cut the guards nice and high so that this thing is super low when it's aired out. But then of course, you need to change your windows to 997 Carrera windows. We need to make custom B pillars. We need to order 992 GD3 Cup Car uh, Perspex windows for the rear because they're the cheapest option. We need to order tail lights, which I've found on Alibaba. We need to order headlights, which I've also found on Alibaba. These need to be Xenon headlights, not the LED headlights because they are controlled by CAN bus, which we can't control with the stock wiring, whereas the Xenon ones we can control because we can put our own custom Xenon setups inside the Porsche headlights. Yeah, there's a lot to think about for this and obviously moving forward, you guys are gonna learn with me on the main channel as we continue to modify the cars. But now let me show you how we actually joined the pieces together because on the main channel I've kind of showed you via time lapse, but I'll show you a little more in depth now. So here we are at our trusty trestle table and and here I have a couple of scrap bits of PETG that were printed that I never used. So we're gonna stick these together and all I use is this trusty soldering iron. As you can see, this thing has had a life. I've put it through absolute hell while we've been sticking all of these parts together. So I probably need to buy a new one soon. So a bunch of people have suggested that I use, like there's plastic welders with the metal staples that you can basically melt into the plastic, but there's a reason that I'm not using those. And that is because we're gonna be bodyworking our pieces of plastic and I don't want pieces of metal sticking out constantly through all of these pieces. So when we're sanding, basically the metal is gonna be a high point, which would make it really difficult to get this all nice and flat. So I prefer just to use a simple soldering iron. We tack everything together. Then we run this Loctite 406 through all of the seams. This stuff is absolutely awesome because not only does it bond really fast, but it actually melts the PETG together. So it doesn't just glue it together. So it's ultra strong. So here you can see we have our ducktail spoiler that we put together in the last episode. So here are all of our plastic welds that we've done. So I just tack it together a bunch of times, and then once that's all tacked together, I flip it over, 
run our glue through all of the seams and that is strong enough to where I can pick it up, place it on the car and dummy fit it wherever we need it. Once we're happy, we go ahead and fiberglass underneath the pieces. So I'll cover all of the joins with fiberglass. Then before we permanently do everything, we'll fiberglass everything two or three times so it's super strong. Then over all of the flat surfaces on the car that are gonna see a lot of UV or sunlight, we're actually gonna fiberglass on the top with 0.4 mil fiberglass cloth. So on the bottom we're using fiberglass mat. That's the stuff right here with all of the strands. This stuff sticks really well with our resin to the plastic. The fiberglass mat with the resin, we couldn't remove it. Like I've tried to literally physically pull it off the plastic and I can't remove it. So the adhesion is really good. We haven't tested the fiberglass cloth yet so I'm unsure how that's going to go. I mean technically we could just run fiberglass mat over the top as well but that stuff just looks a little messier. So this is the fiberglass mat that I'm talking about. It's quite thick and then here is the cloth which is really really thin. So you just lay that over the top of the panel just to give that that last bit of extra strength and protection. Obviously we haven't got that far with the build yet so we'll decide as we go how we're gonna do everything. But let's stick these two pieces of plastic together in real time. Also mostly I just use my hands to hold them together while I'm sticking them together. I'll show you in a second how that works. But if you have a really tricky piece, I like to use these G clamps. So they've got the rubber feet and they squeeze shut slowly like this. They're really easy to use. You just get them from the hardware store, but these are the best by far if you need something to hold them together. You just find a flat surface on both sides, pin them together, and then you can lay your first tack. But basically when I'm sticking the pieces together, these don't actually match by the way, they're just random pieces, but let's pretend they match. So you hold it to where they match up. Then we grab our soldering iron, Lay the first tack, so you hold it for quite a while to get nice penetration, and then you can actually put your soldering iron down, and you can shift the piece around for quite a while while that tack dries. So you've got quite a bit of time to kind of get it perfectly aligned while the tack dries, boom. And then I can kind of hold my finger over it to, to dry the tack a little bit faster. And then it goes off like fairly quickly once it's kind of held there. Then I'll lay a tack on the opposite side, Hold it for quite a while until it melts the two together. You can see it pretty clearly when it happens. All right, we let that go off, and then I'll do a bunch of tacks in the middle to hold the pieces together. And even just with three tacks on it, the piece is strong enough to kind of pick up, move around, you know, it's not gonna go anywhere, which is super nice. And basically, once I've got a whole bunch of pieces together, then I'll run the glue through it, let it sit for 10 minutes, and then go again, especially on the big pieces. So say we were doing this guard right here, I would tack like a bunch of these pieces together, maybe around the headlight piece, and then I'd stop, run the glue through all the seams, let that sit for 10 minutes, and then go again and tack the next part together. That way, that's nice and strong, and you don't have to risk having it fall apart like we did in this clip right here that you see. So this, so that clip was just tacked together with minor tacks because we were obviously learning that was the first panel we ever did. No glue, I picked it up and it fell to pieces which was absolutely heart wrenching because we'd spent so many hours putting the first piece together which is just quite hilarious looking back on it now. But yeah, with a bit of patience you'll be able to build panels just like this and I've got to tell you, printing your first piece, so satisfying and then putting your first panel together just it's actually mind-blowing. Seeing the shapes come together and then building something like this is just the most satisfying thing you will ever do, I promise you. But like I said at the start of the video, it's not for the faint-hearted. It takes a lot of grit and determination to make something like this happen. But it's also super nice coming into the shop and seeing this shape sitting here. Honestly, it makes my day every single day. That's pretty much the end of this video. Jump in the comments. If you guys have any questions at all, this channel is for videos exactly like this. So if you wanna know anything, if you want information on anything, I'm always happy to share it and I'll go ahead and make a video for you guys. Thank you for watching. Mike Lake V channel has kicked off, which I'm stoked about. We're going to Japan in five days and I'm gonna try and daily vlog in Japan and drop all of the videos on this channel. So yeah, we're gonna be hanging out with a bunch of awesome friends over there as well. I'm super excited. I'm taking my fiance Tara. She's an absolute good time as well. So that's gonna be sick. But yeah, thanks for watching. If you decide to build your Porsche GT3 RS, I wish you the best of luck. I've already planned the next car that we're gonna be building after this. It's gonna be another 3D printed car. It's gonna be even crazier than this. So we're on an upward trajectory. It's a good time. Thank you. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.